Friday afternoon, folks, the 22nd of July, one week after the Ides of July. Uh, Ted Ralston here hosting our show, Where the Drone Leads, on Think Tech Hawaii in downtown Honolulu. And we've got uh, kind of the three musketeers on today, three yeah. people who started this whole interactivity maybe three or four or five years ago. Yeah. Dr. Song Choi from UH in the How studio. You, Thanks, Song, for coming on again. Always a pleasure to, Always a pleasure to see hear you. your varied opinions and uh, great experiences and wisdom coming our way. Very disappointed. And then, <laughs> on the other end of the UH domain, in Washington, D.C., we have Chuck Devaney, who is a UH uh, star graduate out of, uh, actually out of the culinary school on Kauai, and then out of uh, geography in Manoa. And now, after we educated him here in Hawaii, a star student goes to D.C. Of course. To get a career on the East Coast. Of course. But he's still got an Aloha shirt on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're never going to get that off of him. That that's, uh, goes as a trade. Actually, in February, he wears them, too, in D.C., believe it or not. Even better. Right? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, one of the issues we have to think about is, is uh, how we generate the cookies that bring guys like Chuck back into our domain here in Hawaii. Yeah, of course. And after he's uh, learned what the world's all about uh, from the perspective of a U.S. operator on the East Coast and get him back over here. Of course. So, Chuck, let, uh, let's uh, hear what you're up to these days. Well, I'm still at the UAS Academy. Um, we finished up Trident Inspector. That was something that we had uh, we talked about uh, previous. Other than that, we I've been doing a lot of cinematography work for ABC Network, uh, Good Morning America, um, 2020, uh, ABC's 2020, um, other, and then also just uh, you know your typical R and D stuff in terms of uh, software defined radios, um, in integrating that into uh, UAS to be. Uh, a, an antenna, if you will, and then also doing some heavy lift copter um, integration as well. Chuck, is there anything in the world of unmanned earth systems you aren't doing? <laughs> um, well, it, it's not always in the air, Ted. There's, uh, we, ha we now have a, uh, a submarine that we've been uh, testing, and uh, we actually have it uh, swimming rather well, um, we're, uh, and we're integrating an autopilot into that as well. And then also uh, we've got a we've got an autonomous rover that we've been working on as well that uh, um, has some different sensors we've been putting on it, looking for different uh, you know like uh, aerosols, gases, you know any biological um, agent that might uh, be hazardous to the human. So we put the robot in first make, to uh, clear the building and make sure they're safe, and then uh, send in the personnel after that to clear it. You know, we have something we're going to talk to Chuck about either on the show or off, and that's the inspection of uh, uh, bunker fuel fuel tanks that are dry but need to be inspected for rust, corrosion, and uh, weld quality and this sort of thing. Uh, so we need to talk about that, Chuck, in terms of uh, UASs that can fly inside the tank and, and aren't a source of ignition but are able right. to carry the various sensors that will pick up indications of corrosion yep. and cracks and such. Yep. That's just a, a shop talk here among us. Anyway. Uh, uh, Song is here representing the the larger activities at the university, and been working together for some time on quite a few years now. Yeah, on, uh, on these several workshops we've had across the university, and and what goes through my mind, and Chuck's a great example of that, is uh, the whole world of UAS, like robotics, is cuts across all the departments mm -hmm. at the university, mm -hmm. any university, not just UH, but any. But universities are are basically designed around departmental structures and people get rewarded for doing well in their departments. Mm -hmm. uh, they get uh, rewarded for um, notifications and publications in mm -hmm. their departments. Mm -hmm. the, what we see here with unmanned air systems or unmanned underwater systems mm -hmm. or unmanned surface systems, robots in general, is things that cut across all these domains and even reach to the end user. It could be Hawaiian studies, it could be the uh, archaeology department, it mm -hmm. could be the emergency management people. So how do we think about designing a program that's effective and attractive to kids coming in from high schools and such that allows it to operate within that departmentalized structure but across those department boundaries okay. so that everybody's kind of sharing together and still get them out in four. Oh, of course. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Big challenge. Okay, well. The so long as it's all on you. Don't feel any pressure, do you or anything? Well, the Who's biggest challenge is always getting them out in four because uh, mm -hmm. with all the requirements that's happening these days, it's literally impossible to miss a class and graduate in four years. So that's a big challenge. Uh, but as, as to your uh, comment about uh, getting the students involved with not only the robotics aspects, but the applications and the environmental aspects, I, I think that's a direct tie. Um, you know, 
I've, I've been involved with uh, underwater robotics for many, many years, and that also involve uh, mobile robots and uh, aerial robots. You know, the one commonality about all these things is that the technology, the algorithms, the process by which you solve these problems are very similar. So it may, may uh, be uh, uh, used in different environments. Underwater is obviously different than the uh, air uh, environment where uh, in the air everything is very quick motions and you have to have quick re uh, recovery time. Where underwater, all the motions are very slow. The medium is very thick. Uh, we're more worried about the uh, momentum that's created by the motions and all that. And of course, you have other various aspects, the water itself, the, uh, the presence of light, the uh, presence of other type of materials in the air. Um, and, and if you think about it, it really is no different than uh, all the little spacecrafts and the s satellites that we've been putting up in space. So what you're sort of saying is we really need to focus on the things that are common across mm -hmm. all these, mm -hmm. and there's common aspects and common design thoughts, common systems engineering approaches, and there's, a, there's some root commonality of course, that connects all these things. We need to pull that up and highlight it, of course. and that's what we focus on. Uh -huh. and, and so, so like you said, if, we, if we're looking at different environments, air, water, land, space, the commonalities in that, in, that, in that middle area where all these vehicles, the control algorithms, the, uh, uh, the, the, the ways by which we have uh, integration, they're very similar. And we want to make sure that they understand the generalities of the similarities, but at the same time understand the specifics about each of the different environments. So uh, what, what Chuck was talking about today was very interesting because he's working with uh, aerial vehicles, but at the same time now he's working with underwater vehicles to try similar control algorithms. You know, I'm, I'll be the first to say, if we got rid of some of the bottlenecks that we run into in engineering, for instance, power, would we have any problems? Probably not. If somebody came up with the Star Trek dilithium crystal. And the battery. We were, yeah, the battery. The and battery could, for all time. At all time, anytime, all the time. No charging required, you just run it and it works. So let's select the underwater environment. If we were to use a battery like that, and we just light everything up, where is the engineering need? We just use the same thing like we're doing right now. I mean, we're, we're talking to uh, Chuck over the internet and we can see everything, we can move everything. We have no problems. And you know, I think that's so, what we're trying to get to. And that's, that's really interesting. There's so many directions this conversation could go. Um, I want to highlight one thing that is like a, a near-term end state, if you will, mm -hmm. if there's such thing as a near-term end state, mm -hmm. and that is the week of the 2nd through the 7th of October mm -hmm. here in Honolulu at the, at the state capitol mm -hmm. where uh, DBED is arranging, Jim Christofuli and the gang and the uh, Aeronautical Advisory Committee are arranging for Aerospace Week of course, to be right. taking place. I think it happened a couple of years ago in the same way. And I think we have a, a, a flyer here that uh, Zuri will pull up in a minute. Mm. But we'll have, I think, a weekend where there's an opportunity for contacting kids. There we are, Aerospace mm -hmm. Week in Hawaii, the 2 through the 7 of October. A lot of focus on unmanned air systems, a lot of focus on uh, the corresponding ground systems as well, okay. and we're in the, in the, in the bit middle of structuring this together right now. But it looks like it's right. going to be access for the kids and families mm -hmm. on the weekend, and mm -hmm. then I think the height of it is the third and, or the middle of the week where we have the actual conference itself. But a lot of opportunity here that we have to generate and give people a chance to come down here and see exactly what you're illustrate that. Uh, I can illustrate a, a battery, yep. I can illustrate a sensor, mm -hmm. I can illustrate a propeller. Mm -hmm. Something that's a little bit abstract is a bit hard to illustrate. So it's that abstraction that is where the where the commonality is across all these oh, department okay. of boundaries. So, <laughs> so I'm going to challenge to you is to figure out how to illustrate abstractions. Uh, yeah. uh, I'll give you the best abstraction okay. in engineering. Um, how can you illustrate the flow of electricity in a wire? I'll go see Wayne Chiroma. There you go. But if you really think about uh, flow of electricity in a wire, if I had a clear plastic tube and poured water down it, it oh, isn't okay. that, in a way, a So there, Let's thing. take that for a minute. Let's, and let's ask Chuck to, mm -hmm. to weigh in on this for a minute. Let me just take what you just said mm -hmm. and turn that into a, a, a table demonstration okay. at the aerospace. Okay. Uh, let's think of how, how we can illustrate the reality in that, of an abstract term like an mm -hmm. algorithm that is useful to uh, Hawaiian studies, useful to archaeology, mm -hmm. useful to the uh, natural sciences people. And, and think how to illustrate the reality of a 
of an abstract term like that. That would be so useful to communicate our need statement to the senators and the legislators who are going to be interacting with okay. that bunch. Okay. So let's hold that thought for a minute. We'll, okay. think, we'll think up an answer here. Actually, it's on you to think it up. But let's ask Chuck to uh, Chuck weigh in on this conversation a bit. How would we take these abstract terms and think of uh, Song's concept here of finding that root common denominator that connects the various departments through robotics and, and U.S.? How would you, from your perspective, think about that and, and help us illustrate that? And by the way, we want you out here the 2nd through the 7th <laughs> representing the... Uh, Unmanned Air Systems Academy uh, as, as part of our, our display and demonstrations. Um, yeah, well, thanks for the invite, Ted. I would dearly love to come back and visit Hawaii. And, and by the way, uh, if you I come, you're not going back. I my <laughs> boat again. Do you still have my boat or did you sell it? No, I got your boat. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, so back to your question and then um, also the, the Venn diagram that, that uh, Dean Choi was talking about where you have the center commonality. Um, a lot of the issue that I that I notice in academia, you also see it, of course, in industry, especially in environments where it's um, very uh, competitive and um, sort of forming up a bubble, like you, you used to see back in the remote sensing days and uh -huh. the early days of remote sensing in the dot com. Um, there's not a lot of communication between disciplines because uh -huh. everybody kind of wants to do their own thing. So now we're we're experiencing a lot of a lot of stovepipes, uh -huh. and it's not just at UH; it's in every university. People are so involved with their own department and in what they have going on because perhaps they're, they're in a race with the people on the third floor, are in a race with the people that are on the fifth floor. In terms of the commonalities to come to you know one table, and I know that the, those efforts have actually happened uh, here and there, and I don't know how effective they've been, but if those, those if that dialogue can continue, the people in Hawaiian studies, the people in archaeology, and the people in mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, um, political science, marine biology, can all come together and say, hey, what do you need? And how can we solve that issue with this piece of equipment here? How can we make your team safer? How can we be more effective and remove um, the human factor from the loop to get a better result? And then go let everybody run back to their departments and then come together again and say, here, here's my solution. Will this work for you? And we test it. We test it and we try to break it and so on and so forth. Rather than live in the stovepipe world of, of the vertical aspect of the third dimension, why don't we try to make everything more horizontal, if that's possible? Take those stovepipes, flatten them out, and make them horizontal. You know, let's take Chuck's thoughts. That's a great mm -hmm. picture he's painted mm -hmm. here. And I'm thinking of the Aerospace Week mm -hmm. again. Let's take, I mean, after, the, after the first break here, let's take a little look at what we might do to preset the stage for what Chuck's talking about. That is, right, starting right now, and go to all the departments and say, what would you see as something that would be useful to you and your pursuit of education and such and useful to you that you know that the industry you're associated with is involved in and pre-arrange by getting them to think hard about this and have that total set of information on the table in illustrated form and the algorithms then are the pieces that connect them all okay. and and we can actually physically generate a viewable uh, object that is the use of UAS in pursuit of quality of life in Hawaii. How's that? That's so, great. That's okay. Great. Yeah. So you'll help me do it? I uh, would help you do it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's talk more about that after our first break. Sure. Hi, I'm Donna Blanchard. I'm the host of Center Stage, which is on Wednesdays at 2 o'clock here on Think Tech. On Center Stage, I talk with artists about not only what they do and how they do it, but the meat of the conversation for me is why they do it, why we go through this. A lot of us are not making our livings doing this, and a lot of us would do this with our last dying breath if we had that choice. And that's what I love to talk to people about. I hope you enjoy watching it, and I hope you get inspired because there's an artist inside you too. Join us on Center Stage at 2 o'clock on Wednesdays. Bye. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea. Please join me every other Monday to hear lawyers from Hawaii discussing ways to reach across the sea and help people and bring people together. Aloha. We're back, folks. Ted Ralston here, hosting our show Where the Drone Leads, downtown Honolulu at Think Tech Studios. We have our excellent guest on, Dr. Song Choi from the hey. university here again. 
and uh, Chuck Devaney, who has uh, escaped the gravitational pull of the university <laughs> currently you on the East Coast. And we're just talking about getting Chuck back here in the 2nd to the 7th of October for the uh, uh, Aerospace Day or Aerospace Week at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. And if we do it right, we can set a trap and keep him here. We need to well, I'll also tell you a better trap. So that weekend, uh, 7th and 8th, we also have a VEX robotics competition at Kamehameha Schools. So that might ah. be a great time for somebody to come over with a couple of these uh, UAVs or UASs and even have demos to get the students excited about potentials of what they can do by understanding and participating in robotics. So this, okay, we can tie those together. We'll have a lot of uh, industry here. We'll have a lot of people and a lot of individuals. Mm -hmm. Why don't we do that? Why don't we see how we can enhance that Kamehameha experience yeah. by bringing some of that functionality yeah. into it? I mean, it'd be great if we can get some industry and some people that really are playing the end game to be at a middle school, high school activity saying, hey, this is what you can be when you get out. What a great incentive that uh, I'm going to spend another four years in high school and another four years in college because there is actually gold at the end of that rainbow. Cool. So let's do that. Let's uh, let's uh, hook that up with uh, the guys at DBED sure, sure. and uh, make that make that part of the deal. Sure. You know. And then as we were talking, uh, we were talking. I had this great idea of yours. Mm. Thank you. Of uh, <laughs> General Wong comes on the show from time to time. He has so many bright ideas. We have to limit him to three bright ideas per show. Okay. <laughs> you're you're going to be under the same limitation. So you've already done one. So uh, you know, only two more for the, okay. the whole show here. But the idea was to has some way to graphically illustrate the issues of collaboration that Chuck brings up mm -hmm. and the things technically that connect these collaborative things together mm -hmm. in order to get past the departmental boundaries and such. Yeah. And some physical, realizable function that we can illustrate in three-dimensional art that uh, anybody can quickly observe mm. with what we're speaking of here, to keep away from long narrative and keep away from monologues and keep mm -hmm. away from uh, arcane technical explanations, which 90% of the people can't won't bother to read and, mm -hmm. and won't. So we'll take that on and we'll keep, we'll have Chuck keep re reminding us as we have to, we have this obligation right here in front of the public to come up with this wonderful three-dimensional of course, uh, of course. attractant of some kind. So. But you, you know, like, like what we've always been talking about, uh, you know, pictures worth a thousand yeah. words. And, and a three-dimensional thing for yeah. 10,000 words. Yeah, a video is worth a million words. That means a demonstration is probably worth a billion words. Okay. So if we can show some sort of demonstration that illustrates some of the ah. physical concepts of physics, or what's even harder, uh, visualize mathematical concepts. I think that'd be incredible. Uh, like I was talking about illustrating the flow of electricity as basically flow of water going down a pipe, because that's really the same thing. I bet a senator or a legislator of some kind could probably understand that graphically. Yeah, we actually showed that to somebody before. Did you? Then, okay, <laughs> so you tested it already. Okay. Yes, we, and it was with the senator and a <laughs> house rep. Okay. Uh, but you know, Chuck, since you're at uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Unmanned Aca uh, the, uh, Academy, you know, how do you illustrate to a, a young person what autonomous or automatic control is? That's, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard, to, do, it's hard to, to illustrate it mathematically. Um, you know, um, I guess in terms of autonomy, I, I, I show them a flow chart. Mm -hmm. and kind of give them an idea of the historical concepts and it'll be very um, um, application oriented so mm -hmm. it'll be something like we are going to use this aircraft to collect data that we're going to generate a base map and derive some actionable information from mm -hmm. so I'll show them that flow chart and I'll show them um, what the possibilities are in terms of error and precision mm -hmm. if a human were to fly the aircraft and then I show them the possibilities of better precision and accuracy if the computer flew mm -hmm. the, the aircraft mm -hmm. and let them see both of it mm -hmm. um, you know a lot of these guys you know young kids we, we do a lot of STEM 8 and STEM 10 classes okay. and then and then we also educate um, industry professionals, but that's more on maintenance, operations, safety, and training. Um, some of these kids in the STEM 8 and STEM 10 class are, are really sharp, and they get it. 
and then others, of course, are you know more interested in um, Pokemon Go. <laughs> um, but you know that's just just how it is. So I guess I I use a lot of flowcharts yeah. and actual live demonstration and say, hey, I want you to try to fly this, you know, using a simple quadcopter mm -hmm. and try to do a raster type pattern, and we're going to process that imagery, and you can see all the pukas in it. Mm. Then we're going to have the computer fly it, and you're going to see the differences in the output in the end. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times then they'll understand what it does, but they're not really going to understand what it is in terms of, you know, um, the, uh, the, the, the PID IDs and all of those different parameters that drive a, a, uh, an autonomous system. And, and what Chuck's explanation just told us is how complex these abstract terms are and how difficult the expression of them is in the 30 seconds we have with a senator or somebody walking through. Oh, of course. So we're, yeah. we're st this is a great uh, stage point, Chuck, for us to try to build that maybe an, 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 another aspect of the illustrative notion of some of these abstract terms, oh, like okay. autonomy mm -hmm. and uh, autonomous operation. But this then leads, and you mentioned math, I think, at the, at the beginning of the break, or before the break, the, this leads me to just ask both of you uh, and for some feedback on this observation. Well, we're, we're, once we have that state level change where we have algorithms working, we have the, the users talking to the suppliers and the whole system is functioning from a systems engineering perspective, then we have this, we've generated this uh, state of dependence mm. where now people are gonna be depending on these systems to function uh, no different than a way a fireman expects the Scott air pack on his back to function. Yep. He, wants, he wants to know when he goes into that fire, he's going to come out with his still breathing. Yep. And so there is this, this ethics of design, if you will, or ethics of, uh, of integrated design mm. that we have to think about where we start, if we start making, for example, UASs that that same fireman is going to depend on, that UAS better work in all conditions. In fact, if you look out, Chuck, we're having another hurricane coming at us this weekend, so. <laughs> yeah, I know, I've been watching it. It's blowing about 35 out there right yeah. now, I guess, in gusts. So our, our systems have to tolerate that kind of situation. They have to tolerate salt air, they have to tolerate smoke, and they have to tolerate uh, uh, particulate matter in, in the air and such, and, and rain. So we have to come to an ethic of design that allows those parameters to be uh, addressed in the design. Oh, of course, yeah. And so that's a, there's a lot of math, I suspect, involved in that. But I think that's an, an additional function we all have an obligation to, to stand up and talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, Chuck, what are your thoughts on, on that? How we approach that level of ultimate reliability that the, that the users are gonna expect and, and are gonna depend on? Well, um, you, you need to have a, a good sound team of uh, systems engineers that are gonna be able to you know, set, set the requirements and the specifications that um, will have to definitely be rigid and, and very well tested uh, in order to achieve that level of safety and reliability. I mean, if you look at the aircraft industry, um, unfortunately, most of that uh, has been written in blood, you know, to get to, the, get to that point. You know, so maybe we can kind of take those same principles in uh, gen general aviation, civil aviation, um, and, uh, and sort of apply that to uh, the uh, the reliability and the systems engineering that will go into the UAS industry. It's going to have to be that way, I believe, anyway, especially once we, you know, uh, get in, well, after August 29th, we're going to have 107. Um, it's going to be uh, in up and working, and uh, that's going to be scary in and of itself <laughs> with a lot of uh, uh, hobby uh, grade systems out there yeah, um, kidding. <laughs> yeah with with kids 16 years old capable you know eligible to fly an aircraft is 55 pounds and can fly 100 miles an hour mm -hmm. um, and then we're going to have the whole beyond line of sight component so there not only will the aircraft itself need to be uh, carefully engineered but also the the uh, the peripherals the uh, the ground station environment um, all of the all the entire infrastructure will have to be shored up to a certain extent, and then uh, you know a, a, a close, very close watch, watchful eye, a, a white hat service, you know, overlooking all of these different systems out there. I, I can't even like imagine how big it's going to be and, and how potentially dangerous and unstable it could become. You know what Chuck has just outlined is uh, part of the value statement of these FAA UAS test sites of which Hawaii and Oregon and Alaska are bind, bound yep. together in one called the 
Pan Pacific unmanned uh, uh, air system uh, uh, test and research center. And um, I think that what Chuck just outlined is, is, a, is a mission statement or one of, the, one of the elements of the task statement that should be undertaken by that bunch. Uh, not just great. testing for the sake of testing, it's great. testing for the... So if we can illustrate that as well, this issue of this very abstract term of reliability, and il illustrate that in some graphical way that people can understand, that becomes a theme that our state UAS test site, which uh, University of Hawaii and uh, Applied Research Lab mm -hmm. will be involved in, uh, would, would be a great mission statement for us to take on as well as uh, using that as an argument for why we need the necessary investment and such and the partnerships and the, with the industry in order to take that on. But if UH could take that as, a, as its mission yeah. in the unmanned air systems world, not so much structural design or electron, electronic design, but the integrated net result expressed in reliability and safety, that would be a world beater right there. My well, opinion. you know, I think like what you're mentioning is, uh, is perfect because and uh, if you look at what's been happening in the news, uh, and, you know, I, I feel really bad for some of the people that have dealt with on the other side of this, but, like, the Tesla incident in Florida, that really shows you how close autonomy in our regular, everyday life is becoming. And it's actually a pretty good predecessor to all the stuff that we're looking at in terms of drones and these UASs and UAVs, because if they're going to become that common and part of our everyday life, people are going to have to think very deeply about how they are going to integrate into everything that we do. And that, once again, leads back to the expressed values of safety, reliability, of uh, and, and the dependence that's, that's been created. Mm -hmm. And uh, just imagine 10,000 drones flying over Honolulu, for example. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> okay, what are we going to do with that? Right? So, uh, how, yeah. how do you get the planes to land if you do that? I mean, it just doesn't work out. Yeah. So we got some, some head scratching to do here, and we need to illustrate all those things and, and you know, not shy away from these hard problems, but illustrate them in some way, and then get that to be the action that, or the, the debate that drives us to action. Mm -hmm. Guys like Chuck, we've got to get Chuck back here. Chuck, when you come in October, you're not going back. I'll get your boat, give your boat back to you, Chuck, and you, that, that'll be your, your inducement to stick around for a while. We need that external influence brought back into us. And uh, once again, folks, uh, the 2nd through the 7th of October, great chance to interact mm -hmm. with the world of robotics and unmanned air systems, mm -hmm. and we'll do our best. In fact, we should put a tent up there, sure. a tent made of, made of uh, volleyball nets, <laughs> and actually fly these things on the Capitol lawn. You should, and, you and should. We'll, we'll have to put that together. There we are right there, the flyer. Mm -hmm. And with that, uh, Chuck Devaney in D.C., it's now 11 o'clock your time or something really late, and uh, thank you so much for uh, sticking around with us today. 10.30. We'll see you again, 10.30, sorry. And Dr. Song Choi, we'll see you thanks so much for coming on the oh, show. Anytime. And thanks to Jay anytime. Fidel for putting us all together about four years ago in the first <laughs> place. And folks, we'll see you next Friday. See you, Chuck. See you again.